If you're looking for a site to start discovering the world of the Internet of Things, IoT, and low-power wide area networking, then I hope you will find this is a good place. In this totally revised and rewritten course, we will work through all of the basic aspects of the components that comprise a working system and explain the underlying science and engineering. We will select from a huge wealth of devices that have become available over the last few years a popular, low-cost and easy-to-implement connection. We will explain the basics of some of the useful designs and how you can develop your own complete individual system. We will navigate a route through the hardware and software choices and discover how these options may be used to connect devices to devices, machine to machine and devices to the internet, into the cloud. We are all familiar now with the world of interconnectivity, whether it's for very short-range validation of credit cards or travel tickets, or longer-range connections made to receive television from satellites far above the Earth. In between these extremes are systems such as the TV remote control, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, and of course the ubiquitous mobile phone. We can plot a graph of the distances over which each of these systems operate and the amount of bandwidth they provide. All may be used to connect IoT devices, but here we're going to concentrate on this area of the graph where very little bandwidth is used over very long distances. The bandwidth down here is low, too low for video use or even to send an audio channel. It's used for applications that need to send short messages, drip fed, similar to very short SMS messages or tiny tweets. This may not be at first sight to be useful, but the messages may grow over time to be important. In this example, the Oxford Flood Management System, sensors have been placed to monitor the local river levels. When connected to the internet and presented on a web page, this trickle of data builds into a very useful facility full of information. This is a first-class example of what can be achieved with a bit of willpower, some knowledge and low-cost sensing devices. Going back to our graph, we can see that we can cover it with TLAs, three-letter acronyms. The graph can be roughly divided into two generic halves, LAN and WAN, local area network and wide area network. Within this area, credit card readers, RFID and say Bluetooth earbuds are connected that run close to your body and so are called PAN, personal area networking. Systems that cover towns or cities are called MAN, metropolitan area networks. And most importantly for this video is this area covered by low power wide area networking, LP WAN. To be fair, there are many systems that can or will operate here. Obviously, mobile phone operators want to provide a service. They can do this from their national network of radio towers and on radio frequencies that they have purchased licenses to use. They therefore charge for their connections, but as yet don't have the 5G technology that offer really low power operation, so we will discount them. There are, however, bands of free, license-exempt radio spectrum, similar to Wi-Fi, and these are used by two competing but incompatible systems, Sigfox and LoRa. Sigfox is a fully commercial operation. It provides true low-power performance, but with patchy coverage and still costs. LoRa, with LoRaWAN, however, is an alliance of a wide range of suppliers acting in a consortium. There are commercial LoRaWAN suppliers, but more importantly, they use technology that is what is known as open source. The community combines to jointly develop a true, openly agreed, global standard for all to use. LoRaWAN developments are coordinated by the LoRa Alliance. National LoRaWAN networks are common in Europe and are slowly being rolled out here in the UK. LoRaWAN does, however, have a massive trump card in its pack. The Dutch are cool, and as if they needed to prove it, in August 2015, cover the whole of Amsterdam with a network of radio transmitters providing free LoRaWAN coverage. It's called the Things Network. It remains a popular project, and because it's also open, has gone viral. At the time of filming, there are over 33,000 active developers with over 3,000 gateways in over 60 countries, and this is growing rapidly. We are going to follow their example using LoRaWAN in this course, and using the Things Network console to connect our devices to other devices and other applications on the internet and mobile phones. If all of this sounds interesting, then good. We will continue with the first step, registering an online account with the Things Network. It is the central control system around which we can build 
our empire. To register a new account, go to http colon slash slash thethingsnetwork.org and click on this sign up button. Select a username and enter your email address and a solid password. Press the create button. The email verification screen appears. It places a seven day limit on the confirmation of your details to avoid unnecessary and incorrect registration. So go to your email account and open the email that should be sent fairly rapidly and press the account activation button. It should forward you to this account page, account.thethingsnetwork.org. You can modify your account details here using this screen, including the ability to upload a profile picture and enter your full name. Registration is now complete. Welcome to the Things Network. Step one into the world of IoT has been completed. One of the reasons that this course has had to be rewritten is because of the status of the gateway. Gateways used to be relatively arduous to set up, but the TTN gateway is meant to lower the barrier to entry. And it does say on the package, let's build this thing together. Only recently has the Things Industries released its initial array of three products. The Things You Know, the Things Node, and the Things Gateway. Normally, our courses presupposed that gateways were already installed, and the first few lessons would have concentrated on working with things. But these small devices are potential game changers. So let's begin with the gateway. But what is a gateway, and what does it do? Well, here is the relatively cheap internal gateway designed with suckers on the rear to stick to glass. And here is a quick peek inside at the internals. We'll take a deeper dive into all of this in a later session. The imperative at the moment is to get something working. The gateway is similar to a Wi-Fi access point, now commonly seen along corridors or ceiling mounted, quietly flashing away. Some gateways may be seen on rooftops with these slightly larger aerials. As, remember from the graph, Wi-Fi is designed for high-speed local access, whereas the role of the LP WAN is for lower bandwidth over a wider area. Wireless signals, as we will see in a later section on radio communications, are similar to light, and will always travel further when launched from a clear, unobstructed location. That is why radio and television masts are so tall. A gateway in the rural area will be able to communicate with devices 15 kilometres away, whilst in cities, where there is a lot more radio noise, along with tall steel and concrete buildings, will restrict the signal to just a few kilometres. More gateways are therefore needed to cover city areas, so position gateways in the best possible radio location and connect them to the internet. The connection to the internet is called the backhaul and can be made using hardwired ethernet cable, which tends to be the best option if available, via Wi-Fi and even link back via mobile phone data link. The main function of the gateway is to receive signals from the devices or things and relay them back onto the internet and in the reverse direction to take messages from the internet and transmit them back to the device or thing. A gateway can be busy as they are designed to handle connections with up to 10,000 things at the same time. This sounds impressive, but remember, the messages are very, very small packets of data. Now the role of the gateway is understood, we can move on to activate one. When a gateway arrives, it may be marked with a frequency. This is the basic radio frequency used and will be based upon the region of the world in which it will be operating. In Europe, this is usually 868 MHz and 915 in America. The global use of different frequencies is shown here, so double check this, particularly if your device has come from the Far East, where the suppliers will be sending out product all around the world. Installations in schools and colleges will vary slightly from home installations, and you will have to coordinate your work with your local administrator to achieve the very best results. Therefore, describe a domestic installation here where you have more control over the equipment and gain a better understanding of the overall process. This is a typical home internet installation. Your ISP, the internet service provider, normally supplies internet via telephone, cable or fibre to your home. It appears connected to your home router where it can be distributed around your home via ethernet cable or home Wi-Fi. As a typical installation, we will show a PC hardwired to the router and a laptop connected via Wi-Fi. Home routers are normally controlled via a web interface. You will need to know three things about your home router, its address, its admin username, and admin password. And I suppose a little bit about how to use the router. Have courage, it's not difficult. There are too many different types of routers to get into detailed description here, but they should all provide the same function and should have a similar style of operation to the one shown here. 
Before powering up the gateway, navigate to the screen on the router to the section that displays your connected devices. Typically, you are likely to see a list of devices connected to your Ethernet ports and those on the Wi-Fi. Expect to see laptops, tablets and mobile phones connected this way. Now let's introduce the gateway. There are two distinct stages in setting up the Things gateway. Let's call these the initial phase and the final phase. Start the initial phase. In common with more and more electronics that require a degree of initial setup, the Things Gateway, in its initial state, is designed to be its own Wi-Fi access point. So before anything else, connect the antenna, as this protects the module inside from damage. Then plug it in and power it on. Take your laptop and disconnect it from your home router Wi-Fi. Set the laptop to search for new access points, and the Gateway should appear as the Things Gateway, followed by a 12-digit hex address associate with the gateway. The default password is the things, all in lowercase, and the connection should be complete. Don't worry about warnings about there being no internet access. The gateway is currently on its own. The purpose of this initial stage is to connect the gateway to local sources of internet connection. To prove the link between the laptop and the gateway, go to either http colon slash slash 192.168.84.1 or http colon slash slash things hyphen gateway or http colon slash slash things hyphen gateway dot local. They should all lead to this page to go to the formal gateway settings page. This requests your details for the name of the gateway and the Wi-Fi access point for it to be used to access any local internet. Now, beware, there are several gotchas at this point. The gateway name should be unique, have six characters or more, avoid in capitals, and do not use any spaces or punctuation. Now make a note of this name. I have several Wi-Fi access points detected here that may be selected from the pull-down. Finally, enter the password for the access point just chosen, then press save. This reconnecting gateway screen appears as your connection to the gateway is now lost. What has happened is that the initial phase has been completed. The gateway has stopped acting as a Wi-Fi access point and has changed roles to one of being a client on your local internet Wi-Fi that you've just selected. This may be seen by the PC link refreshing the connected list on the router. The gateway is now using your local Wi-Fi to call home, which is confirmed by the blue status LEDs the lower two full on, and the third flashing quickly. Reconnect your laptop to the home Wi-Fi if it's not already done so automatically. Now is the time to return to the Things Network homepage and log in. Once logged in, the browser should cache your qualifications and allow you to access http colon slash slash ttn.fyi slash activate. Navigate to the activate button for the gateway. Click on the register or login button. The system will understand whether you're logged in or not and send you this authorization request. It explains the permissions it requires to continue effectively. So if you're happy, click on the authorized TTN activation button. Activation begins. The system displays your user account here in the top right hand corner of the screen. Check this in classrooms where browsers and user accounts can become confused. If all is well, click on the let's get started button. This is the Register Your Gateway page with some familiar input areas, but just note this Select It Here link. If ever you have a problem restarting a registration, this is the link that allows you to select it from an existing list of gateways. You don't need it for the moment, as this is your first gateway registration. Nothing is going to go wrong, is it? In the Gateway ID, enter the name of the gateway from before, and from the pull-down, again select the correct regional option. Look at the long list that's necessary to cover all of the options for a global product. The UK is still in Europe and will always be as far as this registration is concerned, so select Europe 868 as nothing else will work. This Connect Your Gateway page appears, but it may take a little time for the Continue button to become active as the link is made. Press Continue when it does. This is the Configure Your Gateway page and where the connection method is chosen, the backhaul method referred to before. The current options are Wi-Fi and Ethernet. Either methods can be used at home and cable will be the preferred option, but in class, Wi-Fi could well be the easier option. Enter and confirm the SSID and password used before. Click Configure Gateway once everything is correct. A satisfying green tick should appear, closely followed by the fourth stage and the communication of this first message. 
This can take several minutes, so do be patient. But if it fails, use one of these links, depending upon the status of the blue lights, to go back and restart. Once the fourth green tick appears in the column, everything is set up and confirmed as working. Now click on Account and Console. This takes you to the main page that accesses your applications and gateways. We don't have any applications set up at present, so click Gateways. This page will eventually display the full list of all of the gateways you've established. There is only one at present. We can drill down and add more details about this gateway. On this gateway overview, we can see the details being updated in real time. The status is connected, and here is the update of last seen, confirming the link every 30 seconds or so. Winding down, edit each of the fields by clicking on these icons. This completes the section on gateways. In the next section, we will connect our first thing. There are thousands of things in the world, but to qualify to be part of the Internet of Things, a thing must have at least three elements. These are a sensor or actuator to detect or control the environment around it, some intelligence, and of course, communications with the Internet. There are already many thousands, if not millions of things. We have already seen the river level monitoring thing in an earlier example. We can be sure that there are many millions more yet to come. We hope that as part of this course, you will develop some of your own innovative and world-dominating things yourselves. For the moment, we will focus on one thing, the Things node. Straight out of the box, all you need to do is to open it and either insert three AAA batteries or plug in a USB cable to power it up. Shake it or press the button and click on the Map It link on the Activate page. This global map displays an array of Things nodes and Things you knows, which we will meet in a moment. The map is active, and if left still, we will reveal other devices reporting in. Notice that each node presents this unique number, together with the light, temperature and battery level measurements it's taken. On the top left-hand side of the screen are the zoom in and out buttons. On the top right is a button that pauses or plays the live presentation, and below it, this one that zooms in on your location. Spooky. Whilst it's interesting poking around amongst other users' data as it pops up, we need to move on. Earlier, we used Wi-Fi to initially access and set up the gateway. Here we need some similar method of controlling the node, and this is done using the USB port. We've seen that power can be sent to the node over the USB. Now we may communicate with it, but we need some software to achieve this. The Arduino Integrated Development Environment, or IDE, is one very popular method of communicating with devices, and it may be downloaded from www.arduino.cc. Clicking on Download leads to two further links. This one that allows you to run the software in your browser, or this one that leads to download options for Linux, Mac, and Windows. Select the option for your operating system and follow the subsequent instructions. The software is available for free, but do consider making a donation. We will continue with the full description of how to use the IDE in the next section. Here, we are just going to demonstrate one function. Start the application, and following a brief splash screen, the IDE opens. Here, we are going to talk to the node. Before any communication can take place, we need to identify how the node has been connected. Select Tools and move down to Port. I have only one port available on this machine, which makes selection easy. Some experimentation in selection may be needed should you have more than one to choose from. Either way, confirm the selection and reselect Tools again, and this time click on Serial Monitor. This second window should open. At the base of the screen is a further small pull-down that displays the rate at which the communication takes place. Select 57,600 if this is not already shown. Next to it will usually be the correct default of NL and CR. We are now ready to proceed, so press the button or shake the node to provoke this display. It shows on screen the details of the packet that is just transmitted via radio. The light, temperature and battery level can be seen here. But one of the most important readings is this, the DEV EUI, the Device Extended Unique Identifier, a 64-bit address that uniquely identifies your node. In this section, we have seen the simple direct transmission from local node into a global web page. In fact, we've seen the combined transmissions from many devices onto a web page. IoT sensing and reporting is as simple as that, but it's just a glimpse of the beginning of what we can achieve. We have also seen how to communicate with a node using the Arduino IDE. Now the fun can begin as we move on to the next section with the things you know and programming the first thing.